Have you ever wondered about the origins of Mormonism? Have you ever heard of the little town of Manti, Utah, where each summer a self-described miracle play is staged which depicts everything they really believe? Did you know that the Mormon church ridicules the cross of the real church of Jesus Christ? Stay with us for some amazing revelations. This is a story about wild and crazy fantasies. These fantasies are so peculiar, they've convinced entire generations of innocent people into believing them. These unusual beliefs, if true, can set the stage for the end of time as we know it. The people who created these fabrications believe that every living man and boy has the potential to become a god. They also believe that every woman and girl can become a goddess. They claim that they can have sex throughout eternity and thus create millions of spirit children. This intolerable fantasy is about gods ruling over their own planets and having countless millions worship them and pray to them. The story of a strange science fiction writer, you say? No. This is the story of a young man with a very prolific imagination. This is the story of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Stay with us now as we tell you the truth about this fantasy world, the truth about what the Mormon Church really believes. This is The Miracle of Manti, Fact or Fiction. This series of documentary reports on the origins and spiritual deceit of Mormonism deals with a wide variety of topics that today's Christians need to know about. We advise you now to get your pencil and paper ready so that you may learn the truth about one of the greatest spiritual counterfeits in the history of the world, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today's program, How It All Began. Now... Here's your host, Don Stewart. Hello, I'm happy you're with us. During this series of reports about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we will show you exactly what the Mormons really believe. Over the years, I'm sure you've seen their ads on television promoting family values. Perhaps you saw the Reader's Digest advertisements a few years ago stating that they were Christians. Today, if you were to travel to Temple Square in Salt Lake City, Utah, and take the tour of the place, the guide would tell you that the Mormons are Christians with some doctrinal differences between themselves and mainstream Christianity. Friends, I'm here to tell you that nothing could be farther from the truth. They are not Christians. They deny all the cardinal doctrines of the Bible and historic Christianity. Even if Joseph Smith, Jr., who was the founder of the church, received his teachings from visions, that does not mean that his visions were from God or that they were true. The Bible warns us to test all so-called revelations against the previous revelations of the Bible, rejecting all that contradict the Bible, even if they do come from an angel. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The Mormon church really believes that their prophet, Joseph Smith Jr., received direct visions from God. Among these revelations were that God has a body of flesh and bone like any other man. And, oh yes, this God, who was to become the God of Mormonism, had sex with the Virgin Mary in order to create the baby Jesus. They also teach that good Mormons will engage in unlimited sex in heaven if they've been faithful on this earth. One of our guest commentators is Thelma Granny Gear. She is a former Mormon and the great-granddaughter of Mormon apostle John D. Lee. She explained the problem this way. There'll be no sex in heaven for any person except those few Mormon men, comparatively few, who were married in Mormon temples and were faithful to the end. There's the threat that all other men, including other Mormon men, will be eunuch servants in heaven. The few Mormon men are going to have all the joys of eternal increase. The more babies they have, the sooner they'll become gods. 
They really anticipate becoming a god as god is now through eternal sex and procreation pleasures. Only those people married in Mormon temples and sealed for eternity by the power of the Mormon priesthood. Remember now, by the power of the Mormon priesthood, not by the Spirit of God. They are the only ones who are going to be in the highest heaven where God and Jesus and their supposed wives are. There the Mormon man, as I've said before, keeps his wives pregnant, spirit babies are born, raised to maturity, and then they get to come to this earth and become gods through Mormonism, edicts. Also, they don't believe in the Christian definition of heaven and hell. Mormons believe that Jesus, before he came to earth from heaven, was the spirit brother of Lucifer who eventually became Satan. Of course, they don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one. Furthermore, they teach that Jesus himself was a polygamist who had several wives. Here again is Granny Gear. Among the wives of Jesus supposed to have been Mary, Martha, Elizabeth, and I want to read now from my book, A Photocopy, Journal Discourses, Volume 4, What They Taught. It will be borne in mind that once on a time there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and on a careful reading of that transaction, it will be discovered that no less a person than Jesus Christ was married on that occasion. If he was never married, his intimacy with Mary and Martha and the other Mary also whom Jesus loved, must have been highly unbecoming and improper to say the best of it. I will venture to say that if Jesus Christ were now to pass through the most pious countries in Christendom with a train of women, such as used to follow him, fondling about him, combing his hair, anointing him with precious ointment, washing his feet with tears, and wiping them with the hair of their heads, and unmarried, or even married, he would be mobbed, tarred, and feathered, and rode, not on an ass, but on a rail. This chills my heart to realize that many, many Mormons never live long enough to understand that Mormonism is based on sex and not on grace. Mormonism has a history of bloody persecution and separation from mainstream society. It also contains doctrines that are fundamentally opposed to historic Christianity. Millions of people in the English-speaking world, as well as countless thousands overseas and other cultures, have by now heard of the church and its emphasis on marriage and family. Through public relations efforts such as the Tabernacle Choir and Reader's Digest ads and its huge temples that dot major population centers all over the earth, the church has planted its dedicated missionary force along with its own brand of false teachings worldwide. Mormonism has its share of celebrities, people who are well known and push their faith whenever they can. Even though they say they are like Protestants with some doctrinal differences with the rest of us, the real truth is that they believe that they are the only true church on the face of the earth. They teach that the Mormon prophet is God's mouthpiece on earth. Furthermore, they believe that this prophet will one day direct the day-to-day -day lives of all people on the earth when their strange prophecies come true. To this end, they work constantly, day and night, to fulfill their destiny. Most male members believe that they can become gods. They believe that they can achieve this exalted status by practicing secret temple rituals. The main ceremony, known as the endowment, although recently sanitized, has for many years required initiates to wear peculiar costumes, swearing certain blood oaths, and learning secret handshakes. If you are a worthy Mormon in good standing, meaning tithing to the church and keeping up good appearances, you can earn a temple recommend, which gains you access to any of their temples around the globe. The marriage ceremony for newlyweds is usually performed in the temple following the endowments, which they believe seals them for time and eternity. Such teachings are completely opposite of those of historic Christianity. Now I imagine you're beginning to wonder what this is all about. To understand what the Mormons truly believe, it's better to hear it in their own words. Our producers were very fortunate to be able to secretly record the famous Manti Passion Play. This play, which tells what the Mormons believe, has been presented for many years each summer in the small community of Manti, Utah, 100 miles south of Salt Lake City. 
The Manti Passion Play, which is similar in pageantry to the Oberammergau Passion Play in Germany, is the Mormon story of how you and I came into existence, why we're here, and where we're going. Set on the hillside below the Manti Temple in the city of the same name, the play is presented each evening for several weeks during the summer to what usually amounts to an overflow crowd of enthusiastic Mormons. This is significant since thousands of people can actually see the play each night. As we said, this is a play designed principally for dedicated Mormons, many of whom come to Manti from all over the world to see the spectacle. What you are about to hear and see are selections from this well-produced play. They were recorded despite the presence of heavy Mormon security. The play was secretly recorded on public property at night with special technical equipment by a very brave camera crew. We hope you will find it revealing and informative as you hear spokesmen from the Mormon Church revealing what they actually believe. Sometimes the quality of the video will not be perfect as it was recorded some distance away with a unique night lens to avoid scrutiny by security officials. If they had been caught, they would have been forced to leave the premises without their recording. Following the taping of the play, a copy of the transcript was submitted to noted experts on Mormonism, including the late Dr. Walter Martin, Sandra Tanner, Jim Spencer, and Granny Gear. As you will see, their comments are invaluable in discerning the perplexities of this difficult puzzle. Before we begin our analysis, here's Sandra Tanner and Jim Spencer with some preliminary thoughts as to the reason why the Mormon Church is presenting this play. The Manti pageant is uh, to convince the uh, viewer that all of the churches in Joseph Smith's day had a corrupt view of God, that the uh, Christian idea that God is a spirit and everywhere present and the omnipresence of God, that this is a wrong view, that Joseph Smith saw God literally and received the knowledge that God was a resurrected man. Uh, say approximately six foot two or something, and that God is literally a person that could stand next to Jesus as a separate person. So that this does away with the whole Christian idea of God as um, in his greatness when you confine God to a physical form. But uh, they're trying to reinforce in the play that the churches in Joseph Smith's day were teaching such conflicting and foolish beliefs that Joseph Smith was led to pray what church is right and then from that God tells him don't join any of the churches that their creeds are corrupt everything's wrong and that God's about to give the true church through Joseph Smith so it lays the groundwork for belief in Joseph Smith that he is more credible than what any preacher was saying at that day the Mormon church is always about proselytization they're always about bringing people in uh, to be fair to them they believe they have the right answers. Uh, but everything they do, whether it's the temple tours, temple uh, site in Salt Lake or here in Boise, whether it's the Palmyra pageant, whether it's the Manti pageant, whatever they do, it's about making contacts, uh, getting chances to get the missionaries in, and uh, that's the goal of the Manti pageant, and uh, they, uh, you, you see that all the way through the script. The other side of that coin is, out in the everyday world, uh, there's some duplicity here. In the everyday world, I constantly have church people, uh, Mormon church people, saying to me, gosh, brother, you know, we're, we believe in Jesus, you know, we're brothers, we're the same, and I'll do a radio show or something, someone will call in and say, why are you opposed to us, we're brothers, and, uh, and often in those cases I will say, well, in other words, uh, my pastor can conduct the Lord's Supper. He has the authority to do that. He can do legitimate baptism. So we're all in this together. And they might even say yes, but if they do, they've left to proselytizing and gone to lying <laughs> because they know that they're the only organization. You know, so it's, if they're the true church, how can they have fellowship with the untrue church? And so that's duplicious. But now when they get into the, your home, the missionaries get in there, in the privacy of your own home, where there aren't cameras, where there aren't people to, you know, uh, question their statements, then they very quickly go to the point, you need to leave the Baptist church. 
You need to leave the Catholic Church. You need to leave the Methodist Church. You need to become a Mormon because your pastor has no priesthood. You have, you have no authority for baptism. And baptism is essential for salvation. So, uh, so it's duplicious. As we begin this presentation, here now is an excerpt from the beginning of the play. To set the stage, I need to tell you that the Mormon Church believes that God was once an exalted man with passions and body parts just like any other man. Of course, this is just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that God is a spirit everywhere, all-powerful, and all-knowing. God does not have a body of flesh and bone, but is instead a spirit. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Historically, the Manti play tells the story of Joseph Smith, Jr. and his search for religious truth as he progresses towards the creation of the beliefs that ultimately became Mormonism. The first excerpt features a so-called preacher talking about the existence of God. Now, please keep in mind, as you're watching this, the play is actually mocking everything that the Christian church stands for. Watch carefully. And I stand here tonight to tell you that the day of retribution is nigh at hand. God is everywhere, without body, parts, or passions. We cannot hide our sins from him, and we are all sinners, my friends, born in sin. Is there any redemption from this bondage of sin? Yes, my friends, through baptism we shall be saved. Shall be saved? But he that is not baptized shall be doomed to purgatory, or worse, shall be dead. It's obvious that the preacher is making fun of the Christian belief that God is only a spirit. We wanted to know if most Mormons really believe that God has a body of flesh and bones or not. To get to the heart of the story, we went to Salt Lake City, Utah with our cameras to find out for ourselves. We took a random sampling of people walking down the street, asking them a series of questions. The first one was, do you believe that God once had a body of flesh and bones? I don't believe that is really a question that anybody can answer because nobody has ever seen God. God himself, he does have a body of flesh and bones. As the scriptures say we were created in his image, in his likeness. He doesn't have a tail, I don't have a tail. <laughs> uh, so he's very real. I don't know if he, you know, if he or like when he got it or things like that. I, that's beyond me. It's like counting, trying to count the stars. <laughs> I don't know how many there are. Yes, I believe he did. Uh, I believe that uh, um, he had to create an image. He created us in his image. We have uh, flesh and bones, and, and I believe at one time he did, he did also. As man now is, God once was. God was a human being living on an earth somewhere in this universe. He lived, he died, he was resurrected, and he and his wife began a kingdom. This kingdom includes you and I. We are his spirit children. The children he and his wife have are spirits. The children that your parents and I, your parents and my parents had were human beings with flesh and blood. They received a spirit from our Father in heaven to make that body work. And then when it dies, that spirit separates. It is the concept of life. You, as, once you die and you're resurrected, you stand before God. And if you accepted his teachings, if you or are willing to it, there's it we believe that the, that the teaching and preaching of the gospel goes on. It goes on even into the next life. As, as you die, if you have not accepted the gospel, you will be taught the gospel and have the opportunity to accept baptism and to accept his kingdom and to attain the celestial kingdom. 
Since most of the people we interviewed said that they believe God once had a body of flesh and bones, a belief which is contrary to what the Bible teaches, we wanted to know if some of the men we actually interviewed believe that someday they too would become a god with similar strengths and abilities. I will not become a god, I will become a prince within God's kingdom. And that's the way I believe I will be, if I keep my ways right. This teaching is totally inconsistent with the Bible, which offers the true test of a prophet. The Bible is very clear on this issue. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. There seems to be some bewilderment on the issue, even amongst Mormons. Actually, the church teaches that all of us pre-existed in another life before coming to earth. At a certain point, our Heavenly Father and his many wives had sexual intercourse, and literally created millions of spirit beings that actually would have human form when they came to earth. That's how they believe you and I got here. They teach that our conduct on this earth, and especially how we relate to Mormonism, will determine whether or not we will eventually become a god. Since most Mormons believe that God is really a man with flesh and bones, we wanted to know if most Mormon men believe that they can see God, and if so, what does he look like? I don't know if you can necessarily see him. I mean, I'm sure that if, that if the circumstances were right and, and you needed to see him bad enough that you would probably be able to see him. I can't see him right now, no. Uh, that's something that comes out of personal worthiness. He only shows himself to the very worthy. Those that have met certain requirements he stated. But I believe there are people on this earth that have seen God. Well, he looks like a man. Joseph Smith taught that. I believe it. Can we see God? Let's just say eventually. Uh, I, have, I believe that God does not seek to overwhelm us. He does not want a bunch of children running around scared to death. He wants people who have reached deep within and extended themselves to him and become like him. So he doesn't overwhelm us with his presence. As we'll discover later, it's very important when you're talking to a Mormon to make sure they understand the nature of God. As you'll see by the following comments from some Mormons in Salt Lake City, most of them just don't understand who God really is. He's basically all of us. I mean, he's, he's us, he's in us, he's around us. I mean, I believe that there's, there is a being that is God, but uh, his spirit's around us, and that's, that's mainly what, what he is, is, is more of a spirit. God is that spirit who created the world and created people and watches over his children. God is my eternal father. He's the creator of everything we see. He's given us everything we have. What more can I say? I couldn't answer that. He's a human person, a person who said he is of a superior being. I've never seen him. Nobody has. At this point in our street interviews, things were beginning to get very interesting. I communicate with him through prayer. He communicates uh, to me through, through guidance, uh, answering my prayers, um, and again, through the church by uh, the examples, etc., that, that is set. Sometimes through feelings I get of comfort. Other times, out of the blue, I, I'll be told something to watch out for this and that or to remember something or just thoughts will come to my mind that I know are not mine, but they're there. They're very real. Other times he speaks through people who can help govern me in my life. Not somebody that I don't know, but somebody who's a real personal friend and can help me, uh, such as, a, well, my, my leaders in the church know a little bit more than me. It's a feeling I have when I 
say my prayers to Revelation. And this is something that is, like I say, I got to the point at the language training mission where I had to know whether this church was true because I certainly couldn't go out and teach other people about Joseph Smith without knowing for sure within myself that I could say, I know this is true. That's a revelation that comes to your mind. God speaks peace, speak, gives you an answer. I've had it come in the Word. I've had it come where a word would, or a sentence would come to my mind. Or I've had it come where uh, clearly I received the answer, yes, or whatever, would come to me in an unmistakable, clearly uh, defined answer to your question. Uh, to my question, to my Father in Heaven. Now, as you will recall, this discussion about God started with an excerpt from the Manti play, which made fun of the Christian belief in God because he's only a spirit. We asked noted experts on this cult, including the late Dr. Walter Martin and Sandra Tanner and Jim Spencer, to comment on the preacher's references to God as being without body parts and passions. Well, in Mormon theology, God is an exalted man and has body parts and passion, even uh, sexual capacities. So obviously uh, the preacher is going to be talking about the God of the Bible who is pure spirit and therefore does not have body parts or passion. It's a form of mockery. The Mormons want to make a big issue of the, uh, what they see as the foolishness of Christianity in saying that God's without body parts or passion. By that they want to imply to people that God is not a feeling person, that he's not someone you could feel close to and they're ridiculing the Christian concept. And so by portraying God as a physical presence, someone who appeared to Joseph in a body, they're trying to get the idea across to people that their God is more real, more personal, more approachable, someone they can understand better to make it easier to accept Mormonism. But the Mormon God uh, is uh, very far from a biblical view of God. The Mormon God was once a man who lived on some other earth, who had a mom and dad. He uh, got married, died, went to heaven after so many millenniums, uh, earned the right to become a god to start this world. And so, so the surface, when they say God has a body, that sounds uh, like it wouldn't be too far afield to say, okay, yeah, maybe you could see God as a person. But they, it's what they mean behind that uh, gets so radical that it's uh, anything but Christianity. Uh, you know, the Christian Confession says, uh, if you read your Book of Common Prayer in the Episcopal Church, God is without body parts or passions. And so they want to make the case that God the Father has a body, the God who is the Son also has a body, the Holy, Holy Ghost, we don't know how he's a God without a body, but nevertheless. But they want to distinguish, they want, they're setting us up to say, uh, uh, you have you you believe that God does not have a body, uh, but uh, Joseph Smith, when he went into the grove, saw that the the body is a personage of flesh and bone, just as the sun is, and just as you are, and so they're 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 making a point that they're going to come back to later. We wanted to know why the narrator of the Manti play highlights the phrase "Through baptism you shall be saved." Sandra Tanner, herself a former Mormon and a direct descendant of the Mormon prophet Brigham Young, and Dr. Walter Martin and Jim Spencer had this comment. The Mormons want to make a issue of the baptismal uh, problem between the different churches. They want to play off the uh, one minister against the other, whether or not you have to be baptized, how are you baptized, does baptism save you, because they want to follow it up with their answer that Yes, you must be baptized, but it must be by the right authority. That gives them the ability to bring in their claim that it has to be done by proper authority, meaning the LDS authority. You have to be baptized a Mormon, go through the Mormon rituals, uh, do everything the Mormon Church tells you in order to go to the highest level of heaven. But they're setting the stage uh, to bring in the claims of Mormonism, that you must have proper baptism. Well, through baptism we will be saved. Uh, in Mormon theology, salvation is uh, resurrection from the dead. You're not talking just about the fact of the cross. Uh, in fact, Jesus began the atonement in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sh uh, sweat huge drops like blood. Now, the Bible doesn't say blood, but like blood. And they maintain that it began in the Garden of Gethsemane and then it was completed 
so to speak, on the cross, but even then it wasn't completed because it has to go on through good works in your life, otherwise you can't finally be resurrected. So salvation to them is essentially resurrection. You know, that, that's kind of interesting uh, to me because uh, it's the Mormons that believe that. And I'm not exactly sure why they would put that in there. I, I sometimes think they're not uh, too, too careful in uh, what they're having these uh, Protestant preachers say. In fact, I think part of it comes from ignorance, just really not knowing what, the, what those positions are. But uh, when a, for those that care, when, a, when an evangelical says, through baptism you are saved, they are not saying you're saved because of baptism, uh, they, uh, because the evangelical world has a totally different picture on what baptism is. Baptism, uh, when, when we say you are baptized for the forgiveness of sins, we're not saying you're baptized in order that you might get forgiveness. We're saying you're baptized because of the forgiveness of sins, and you're, and you're making a, a, a tremendous spiritual statement because of, for, the fact that you've been saved. So uh, they've got that. Uh, they've got that little backwards there. If that's exactly the way they say that. Now watch this excerpt from the Manti play, featuring the crowd singing their rendition of an old Christian hymn of the church, "At the Cross, At the Cross, Where I First Saw the Light." Who are we? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the Come on, Mary. He doesn't have the answers either. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. Did you notice something strange about what you just heard? That's right, they were singing this wonderful hymn in mockery off key. Isn't that amazing? Obviously, the Mormons don't think much of the cross of Jesus Christ, or most of us first saw the light, do they? To find out more about what they do believe, our staff again interviewed some Mormons with the question. Does the cross have any personal significance to you? No, it doesn't have any significance. Um, I guess the reason, because it's never, we don't have him in our churches, and so I don't really think about it anymore, other than his, when he died. It has significance to me. What? It tells of the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection. It's, it's sacrilegious. I mean, they're carrying around, it's like carrying a, an electric chair around your neck because one of your family members got electrocuted to death. You know, it's, it just, it isn't right. I, they shouldn't walk around with something like that around their neck or on their, on their body at all. I think that at one time in the old, you know, at the time of Christ, that uh, there were those, belie those, those believers who made it a symbol of their religion, uh, uh, you know, as it grew. But we do not, we believe that, that Jesus died on the cross, but we don't believe that the symbol is necessary on all of our buildings or, or anything else, because then we would be just like all the other churches. We would, you know, essentially uh, be touting what they're touting. We're not. We tout Jesus Christ the man who's, and his teachings, who taught that man, you know, has a, a responsibility to, to accept the gospel, to cleanse his life, live the, live the religion, and to, to be exalted by Jesus himself. Well, we believe we should keep our eyes riveted on the cross of Christ, meaning his mission and his life, his atonement, his sacrifice. We don't have crosses in Mormonism because... Um, I suppose uh, we felt they were perhaps a fetish in and of themselves, uh, a symbol that had gone beyond symbolism to becoming something to adore and worship itself. Uh, the kissing of the cross and other things, I suspect, were... Uh, I think they were republic to most pro repugnant to most Protestants in America when the church was uh, restored. And I suspect Joseph Smith felt the same way, but we try and stay away from any idolatry, and I guess that's why we don't use the cross. That's probably basically it. We believe, well, in just in a live Christ. He lives. Why not remember that? Why, I mean, why so much on the death of him? That's very important, yes, but more important is his life. There have been many men on this earth that have died. 
for good causes, but they haven't come back to life. He's the only one that was able to bring himself back to life. And that's what we ought to remember, that I do owe him my life because he gave up his for mine. Uh, it's a sad reminder because it was a very cruel punishment for Christ to have suffered on the cross. He also suffered greatly before that. But I, I tend to think of Christ living. I, the scriptures say he resurrected and I see him coming forth out of the tomb, things like that. That's what I picture of more than a cross. I don't need a cross to remember Christ. Though. Well, the cross is a symbol of the way God died, or Jesus died, not God, but Jesus died on the cross. And that's all it means to me, is that that's the way he died. Well, as you can see, there are some mixed reactions when talking about the cross, but mostly their reactions are negative. The cross seems to be like a bad memory for most Mormons, something they would just as soon forget. We asked our panel of experts for a quick comment on just exactly why the play features the singing of At the Cross, At the Cross in a mocking tone. Well, you're quite right. It is mockery uh, because uh, At the Cross with the Cross doesn't have a meaning for Mormons because salvation is by baptism, repentance, faith, and good works and obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel as taught by the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, which means that you have to work for your salvation. Whereas in Christianity, salvation is by grace alone through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're justified by faith, something which is anathema to Mormons. They just reject that completely. The play is trying to show a um, very uh, crude concept of Christianity so that the audience will sympathize with Joseph Smith's dilemma of what church to join, because you see these ridiculous preachers with this uh, odd music and these extreme people uh, that will lead the person in the audience hopefully to conclude, well, yes, I wouldn't know what church to join either. I don't think I'd want any of those. So then you sympathize with Joseph going out into the grove to pray, what church should I join? So it's a part, again, of setting that stage to get you accept the Mormon message. You know, this is the, this is the thing that I hope people listen to. That, that is the, the uh, atrocity of this play. It, they are mocking the Christian gospel. They'd be quick to just be horrified if we, you know, put the temple ceremony in its accurate but uh, not so uh, nice light. But here they are mocking at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. To them that's foolishness. The cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. Uh, but it is the Christian gospel that you come to the cross, your sins are rolled away, and you're transformed immediately by that process. And they're mocking it because they got something to sell. It's an A plus B plus C plus D eventually equals salvation. And it's religion just like Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. There's two religions. There's the Christian salvation by an encounter and relationship and there's all the other religions which is if I do this and if I do that and if I do this eventually ping I'll be good enough to be saved it's backwards to the Christian position and they are mocking that position because they know their position is backwards from the Christian position they just happen to think they're right well I see that our time is about up I hope that you now understand a great deal more about The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today we've learned some brief history about the church and who they think God is. We saw that they not only do mock the cross of the real Christian church, we've learned what they really believe happens after death. On our next report in this series, we'll discover how the Mormon church compares with the Bible and with the Book of Mormon, and we'll learn about the church's founder, Joseph Smith, Jr. Please join us then, won't you? And thank you for being with us today, and may God richly bless you. You've been watching The Miracle of Manti, Fact or Fiction. It is our prayer that this series, which deals with the history and theological issues surrounding the cult of Mormonism, will provide you with the truth, so that the next time you encounter a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you'll know what to do. Until next time. May God richly bless you as you seek to serve Him, and may the Holy Spirit inspire you mightily when someone tries to tell you 
about the miracle of Banton.